Images of women in a lot of places in entertainment and advertising in various countries. We see it in sports. This is a beach volleyball uh, shot from the Olympics in Beijing. And uh, even in politics, sometimes this is a United States politician. Sarah Palin was a vice presidential candidate in 2008. And there was a lot of sexualized commentary about her and shots like this of her legs. Increasingly, we also see sexualized images of girls and teens. Uh, here's an example from Japan. Uh, Saya Iri is a uh, Japanese pop star um, with the group Sweet Kiss. She was 11 when this photograph was taken and it was uh, broadcast and spread throughout Japan and elsewhere. This is a photo of a US pop star, Miley Cyrus, uh, taken when she was 15. A pretty suggestive picture was published in Vanity Fair and received a lot of attention. And uh, more recently in two, uh, 2011, this is a French model, Tilan Blondeau, who was featured in French Vogue in sexualized pictures like this, uh, which also received a lot of attention. The American Psychological Association uh, determined to form a task force to study this issue, and I was uh, honored and happy to be part of the um, part of that task force and to chair it. Uh, the report was released in 2007, and it can be downloaded in English from the APA website, and uh, happily uh, now has been translated into Polish which you have in front of you. Uh, thank you to your cause association for doing that. Here's the outline of what I'd like to do in the talk today. First, I'm going to define sexualization for you and uh, give you the task force definition and also some examples. Then uh, I want to talk to you about prevalence, how common is sexualization and what's the evidence that it occurs. The third thing is to talk about the consequences of sexualization. What does it do? What impact does it have on people, on girls and women in particular? And then finally, a few positive alternatives and recommendations that we can think about enacting. So let me start with the definition of sexualization. And the task force came up with four elements that we believe would describe when sexualization occurs. The first one uh, is that somebody is sexualized if their value comes primar primarily from their sexuality. So we value them for their sexiness or who they are sexually rather than for all the other elements of a person, like their intelligence, their kindness, uh, their wit or sense of humor, etc. cetera. Uh, moreover, and this is the second part of the definition, uh, we determine when somebody is sexually attractive mostly from their physical appearance. So uh, physical attractiveness is what defines sexiness, not how funny you are or how, um, how intelligent or so forth. Uh, just how you look, and it's also a very narrow standard of physical attractiveness, especially for women, a very uh, unattainable standard, really, and we can see this because even the models who appear in fashion magazines and so forth, perfect as they are, they need to be photoshopped uh, and changed in order to meet this unattainable standard. The third part of the definition is a very important part, uh, that is that uh, sexualization occurs when someone is sexually objectified or made into an object, a sexual object, to be used by others or to be commodified and to turn a profit from their sexuality. When this happens, it limits the person's opportunity for independent action for themselves. 
It limits their ability to make decisions for themselves. <laughs> it turns them into an object. So this is a very uh, important part of sexualization. And then finally, anytime sexual, uh, sexuality is imposed inappropriately in a context where it doesn't belong or to a person uh, who, who is perhaps not sexual, too young to be sexual, for example, uh, we consider that an example of sexualization as well, or part of the definition. Now, in the view of the task force, uh, all four of these don't need to be present. If any one of them is present, we would say that sexualization is occurring. Uh, now, let me uh, give you some examples, uh, building on that definition, uh, for each of the different components. So first of all, the idea that someone's value comes mostly or primarily from their sexual appeal or behavior. Here's an example of that, some shirts that are marketed to, uh, to teen girls. Uh, and what do they communicate to us? Uh, they communicate that we value girls for their sexuality. So the shirt on the left says sexy. That's what a girl is supposed to be. The shirt on the right says boy candy communicating that girls are tasty treats for boys and men to consume. So that's what's important about a girl, is, is her, her sexiness. Uh, even young girls learn this lesson. So uh, on the left is a participant in a beauty pageant. She's very young, but uh, she has been made up to look like an adult woman uh, she's got the makeup, she's got the hair, she's even got the pose with her hip thrust out. So um, that's a, a sort of a small segment of the population who participates in these, but many more girls uh, participate in this kind of behavior more informally. Uh, the right-hand picture is a place called Club Libby Lou. It's in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. And this is a place where girls can go uh, as a party or with their friends and they learn how to make uh, themselves up with makeup and uh, learn how to strut down the catwalk like a fashion model would do. And you can see here that these girls are, are very young. Uh, the one on the right especially, she still has the little belly, the little fat belly of a child, um, but she's, uh, she's trying to get the walk of an adult uh, sexualized woman. Um, here, moving on now to the second and third element of the definition is an example that <coughs> shows us a bit about both. So this is an ad from uh, a Dior perfume ad, and uh, we can see that this woman in the ad uh, personifies that narrow standard. She is um, very thin but has larger breasts. She's, her skin is white, she is perfect, she has very full lips. So this is a standard of, of physicality that's very impossible for most people to meet, for most women to meet. Uh, and this, and the, it's, we're told that this is the only thing that's physically attractive. Um, so that's the narrow standard. Now it's also an example of objectification. So the focus here clearly is on her body parts. They're there, her torso, her breasts. It's there for us to view, for us to be titillated by, to be excited by. Um, also, the product name is Addict, uh, and her facial expression, she seems to be in pain. Perhaps she is addicted. Perhaps she is in withdrawal right now. That would make her very vulnerable, um, and that's part of this image. Uh, and then you may not be able to see it, but right in the bottom right corner is the slogan for the product. It is, admit it. And this uh, could be interpreted as meaning admit it, you're an addict, so it kind of plays into that theme as well. Uh, could also mean or evokes the idea of uh, something that rapists will say sometimes, admit it, you really wanted it, you really wanted to have sex. So there's a lot of elements to this ad that um, that speak to sexualization. Now, let me give you a, another example in the next slide of a narrow standard uh, of physical appearance. This is uh, an image from the 
swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated magazine in the US comes out every year with models and sometimes with female athletes a uh, part of this uh, image. So you can see here we have women who look very, very similar to each other. There's two women who um, are brunettes, so they somehow didn't get the message that blonde is, is better. Um, and uh, they're a little bit different in how tall they are, and they have slightly different size bikini bottoms, but they look almost interchangeable. And that is the message of objectification and the narrow standard that that women to be valued at should just be interchangeable with each other and, and meeting this particular standard. Now, uh, small in the lower right-hand corner is a tennis uh, player uh, star, Maria Sharapova, who's also being sexualized in being portrayed in her bathing suit. And I'll talk in a couple places uh, today about the role of athletics and what happens when we sexualize women. Now, the final uh, part of the definition was uh, inappropriate imposition of sexuality. So one example of that is uh, making a five-year-old girl look sexualized. But uh, sexuality can be imposed inappropriately in other domains as well. And one of my uh, examples that I, I like to show uh, is uh, a football example, the 1999 Women's World Cup Finals. Um, it was very exciting in the U.S. Uh, and a very exciting game. Uh, Brandy Chastain uh, ended up scoring the winning goal for the U.S. team after a, a very close match and a series of intense uh, penalty kicks, 30 minutes of overtime. Now, as is common with male soccer players, um, she, at that moment of jubilation and the athletic victory, she tore her shirt off. Uh, and was celebrating with her teammates. Now, what is different from what happens with a male uh, football player um, is that these actions, this action was sexualized by many commentators, at least in the United States. So um, they made reference to what they called her strip tease. She was called the owner of the most talked about breasts in the country. And then by association, her whole team was sexualized when one commentator referred to the team as the booters with hooters. So the kickers with breasts. Um, so I, this is, I think, a clear example of sexuality being imposed inappropriately. And I would say it's kind of ridiculous, really. Does this look like a striptease to you? This doesn't look like any striptease that I've ever seen. And uh, also, I think if we look at her face, we would agree that sex is the last thing on her mind right now. She just won the World Cup for her team and her country. She's not thinking about how sexual she looks. So it's a very um, odd imposition of sexuality in this context. Um, I'll just note also that this is also an example of valuing someone apparently more for their sexuality than for other aspects of them. So what we should really be thinking of right now for her is her great athletic achievement, uh, not what she looks like or what her breasts look like. So um, it seems skewed that we would value her more, that we'd want to talk about her breasts more than that we'd want to talk about her athletic achievement. Um, so these are some examples of adult women being sexualized, but girlhood itself is often and also sexualized, girls and girlhood. So here are two examples. The one on the left is from a New York Times fashion outlay a few years ago, and the one on the right is another Dior perfume ad. So let me talk to you about the one on the left first. Uh, so this is an adult model, she's over 18, but she's made to look very young. She uh, is um, wearing pigtails, which suggest youth. She's wearing a little girl dress. He's picking at the dress in the way um, a little girl might. And uh, yet, she's also sexualized. So the pose um, here 
Um, actually, I'm not sure how well you can see it, uh, but it, it looks like, uh, when, when we look at it in the, in the spread, it looks like she has a naked upper thighs and naked buttocks and then some, uh, some knee socks on, some socks that come up to her thighs. Uh, actually, that's not what's, uh, what she's wearing. She's uh, wearing some shorts, flesh-colored shorts, and then her knees and her, um, her lower legs are bare. But it's, it's meant, we're meant to think the, the other, and that's a very actually pornographic shot to have, see somebody's bare bottom. Um, and then juxtaposed with her wearing the pigtails. And then you definitely can't see this, but in the original spread, she's sitting on a box and the word bang is written uh, along the box, uh, which in English tends to evoke a thought of gang bang or a group rape. So uh, there's that violence aspect also that's very subtly in included and communicated. And of course, uh, a fashion spread like this is very expensive. Every detail is attended to. Nothing is accidental. Uh, somebody made a decision about every single element of this picture, and they determined exactly what they wanted to do, which was to present a childlike figure that was also sexualized. Now, on the right-hand side, we see, uh, again, another Dior ad for Addict 2 perfume. And uh, we also, this, uh, this model is sexualized, but in contrast to the first model, who was clearly a woman, she had breasts, uh, and she looked older. Here, our model has a very boyish figure. She's flat-chested. She's in her underwear, but it's little girl underwear. So there are, and she's also, she's twirling her hair, which is uh, something that you would think a little girl would do, not a woman. And yet, she also is sexualized. She's got that pout to her lips, her midriff is bare, and she's in her underwear. So um, this is a combination of the sexuality, but also the more childlike qualities. And then this one also has a slogan at the bottom, which is very small, but it says, the fragrance, the scene, the new sensation. Now, on the surface, this is the perfume. The perfume is the new sensation, but the subtext is that this girl is the new sensation, perhaps the new sexual object to be introduced and used. Um, sexualization also occurs in the products that are marketed to girls. So uh, here are two examples of dolls that are that are bought and buy and played, uh, young girl, very young girls play with these dolls, uh, ages three, four, five. The Bratz dolls uh, are known for their sexualized clothing with the feather boas, the thigh high boots, the mini skirts, um, kind of dressed to look like prostituted women, uh, very, very full lips. Uh, Barbie, who has always had a very unrealistic body, uh, and, and miniskirts and so forth, she has been more sexualized as well <laughs> and to keep up with brats. And this is a, a Barbie called Bling Bling Barbie. So she's very shiny and glittery and uh, is showing quite a lot of skin there. Now uh, Bratz also makes uh, has, and has marketed clothing for girls, uh, what they call bralettes, little bras. Uh, marketed to girls as young as six, and other manufacturers have done this as well. Something that I would argue is an inappropriate imposition of sexuality because a six-year-old girl does not need a bra. So those are some uh, examples of sexualization, a definition of it that we can use as a working definition. Uh, we've seen that uh, adolescent girls and even young girls can be sexualized. So uh, what I want to move on to now in the second piece is to talk about how prevalent this is. Do we see a lot of it or do we see a little of it? And uh, for the task force report, the team of psychologists who were part of this uh, task force reviewed hundreds of studies, about 300, slightly over. And we looked at uh, every media uh, genre that was uh, available that had been studied, and in every one we found that sexualization was pervasive. 
So uh, in television, in music videos, the lyrics of music, cartoons, magazines, uh, video games, sports media, internet, advertising, basically everywhere we look, we saw lots of sexualization of women. And there's more details in the report about all of these different genres, and I hope that you'll find it interesting to look at that. I'll just talk uh, through an example, a couple of examples from uh, one of the genres. So uh, television, for example. Um, one study found that female characters are more likely than male characters to be provocatively dressed. Another study looked at US TV episodes, uh, 81 of them, and 84% uh, of these, so a very large majority, had an incident of sexual harassment, an objectifying um, thing that happened to a woman in the uh, episode. The average number per episode was 3.4. Uh, what did these look like? They uh, included sexist comments. So these are pejorative terms for women, uh, broad, bimbo, uh, dumbass, uh, or sexual comments that refer to body parts. Uh, and these are all euphemisms for breasts, jugs, knockers, and hooters. Uh, if we go on and we look at music videos as a genre, uh, there are high levels of sexual content, much of it sexually objectifying to women. Uh, and of course, these music videos are exported from the U.S. around the world, including to Poland. I saw them in my uh, the hotel room gym yesterday when I was uh, down there, and uh, all of these are available worldwide, not just in the U.S. Uh, they often include women dressed in provocative clothing or women whose function in the, in the um, video is just to be decoration, just to be an object that dresses things up, if you will, and sexualizes things. They're very often portrayed as sexually available, especially to the male um, singer who is the star of the video. And men in these videos are very often portrayed as uh, sexual players who want to have very many women and uh, not have relationships, but simply uh, go through women sexually very quickly. Um, now here's, uh, here's a picture from a, a, a rap video, and hip hop and rap are two genres that are especially known for their, um, for their objectifying uh, portrayals of women, but they're not the only genres that do so. Um, this example here, Nellie's tip drill video, is kind of an infamous example, both because it was very sexualizing, and one of the things that Nellie did in his video uh, was to portray women uh, like um, ATM machines, and he swiped credit cards down their backsides, um, sort of the idea that women uh, can be bought. Um, and so it's very objectifying, but also was uh, the cause of a protest by some African American university students in Spelman College, which is a uh, mostly African American college. Uh, and they, uh, this is kind of a longer story, but they, they uh, staged a protest about this uh, because they were um, angry that an African American artist was objectifying his African American sisters in this way. So hip hop is, uh, is, is quite bad, but not the only genre by far uh, that looks at, uh, that objectifies women. One study looked at country music videos, also found a lot of objectifying content. And then another study looked just generally at everything that's shown on the MTV network and found uh, sexualization present across the different, across the different genres. So uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, negative uh, portrayals of women in in videos, and uh, you might think that it's only the male artists their videos do this, but in fact, female singers have had to sexualize themselves in order to advance their careers and uh, be more successful. We could show many examples of that, but one in particular, Lady Gaga, who's an international. 
star, uh, very popular, and very often um, uh, appears in sexualized clothing or um, in very little clothing. And these are just two example pictures of her. Uh, um, moving on just quickly to another genre, music lyrics. What are, what are the words in music and what do they convey about women? There are fewer studies that have looked at this, but one that was conducted not too long ago tried to be somewhat comprehensive across a variety of artists and looked at quite a few songs and found that in these studies, 15% of the lyrics were degrading uh, in a sexual way to women. And I'll, I'll just give you a few uh, examples of the lyrics, and they have been translated, so um, you can read them there. Uh, these are, uh, these are um, lyrics that treat women as though they are prostitutes uh, and call them derogative names like bitch, uh, very objectifying to women. So, uh, and as I said, these are some examples and there's more information about studies on other genres if you're interested in the, in the task force report. So the next uh, thing that I want to move on to, the third portion of the talk, looks at consequences of sexualization. So we see that they're very prevalent, um, kind of every, every place we look in the media, we see them, but who cares, does that matter? Do they have a negative impact? So that's what the next, the next section looked at. And um, there's a variety of consequences, uh, but I'll focus on these. So one, uh, the impact on girls' health and well-being, the impact on other people, and the impact on society as a whole. So starting with girls and the impacts on them, on their health and well-being, Many uh, of the studies have focused on this set of consequences, um, body dissatisfaction and appearance anxiety and mental health. I'll also talk about cognitive fun functioning and physical health just a little bit as well. So uh, many studies have looked at body dissatisfaction and it's very clear that sexualization and objectification undermine girls' confidence in their own bodies. This lack of confidence leads to body shame, it leads to anxiety about your body, worrying about your body, uh, leads to even as far as disgust about yourself and about your body. And uh, it doesn't even have to be exposure to the most objectifying images. Studies have shown that just reading fashion magazines, or even just being exposed to words like shape, uh, shapely or sexy, lead girls and young women to have increased body anxiety. Uh, it speaks to the fact that it's very easy to bring up um, memories or ideas like this to prime what we've already internalized. We've gotten so many messages now over the years uh, that just saying the word shapely or just opening a fashion magazine can be enough to trigger a feeling of anxiety about your body. And this is a area that's been very, very well studied. Many studies have demonstrated it, including many experiments, which is the tool that social scientists use to really get at the question of cause. So what causes what? Is it that women who are anxious about their body look to fashion magazines in order to try to feel better, learn some tips, beauty tips, etc., and figure out how to feel better about their body? Or is it the vice versa, that when you read these magazines, then it causes you to feel bad about yourself? And uh, the experiments help us to answer that question and to be able to say with confidence that reading the magazines, being exposed to these images, causes uh, girls and young women to have an increased amount of anxiety about their body and an increased amount of dissatisfaction about their body. So the, the evidence is, is pretty strong here uh, for this particular effect. 
Another effect that has been studied fairly extensively is what is the impact on girls' mental health when they're exposed to sexualization. And the three uh, main effects are depression, low self-esteem, and eating disorders. And these, uh, interestingly, and maybe not accidentally, are three of the most common mental health problems for girls in the US and also in other parts of the uh, Western world. And these are linked to this, uh, these objectifying messages that, that girls are consuming. There's again a lot of studies, including experiments that help to confirm the direction of what's causing what. Um, I'll just mention briefly one other study, kind of a natural experiment. We're in the Fiji Islands. Uh, Western TV was not available for many years and uh, it was introduced uh, all at once and uh, a researcher there was able to look at um, uh, disordered eating before the introduction of the Western television and after the introduction of it and found a spike uh, after Western TV was introduced. So suggesting that it was an important cause of that, of that spike of um, of eating disorders. And again, many studies have looked at this, so this is, I think, fairly well established. Let me talk to you a little bit about cognitive functioning, about um, thinking, problem solving, uh, what goes on mentally and, and academically. There have been a number of studies now that have suggested that sexualization may impair cognitive functioning, may actually impact how girls and women think. Uh, and this first experiment, it's been replicated a few times, it's kind of famous now, was an uh, experiment where some participant was, participants were told that uh, they were in a marketing study, they were gonna comment on some different products, and some of them were assigned to try on a sweater, a loose fitting sweater, not sexualized really, and others tried on a, a bathing suit, a swimsuit, one piece swimsuit for women or uh, trunks for men. And then the participants were told, uh, we want you to get a chance to feel what it's like to be in that piece of clothing before you rate it, before you tell us whether you like it or not. So can you uh, work on this other study for us and uh, it involved um, doing some math problems. And the, uh, the women who were in the bathing suits showed reduced ability to do their math problems uh, as compared to the women in the sweaters. There was not an effect in this study for men. The explanation that the researchers put forward was that because the women in the swimsuits were so focused on how they look, they were uh, in a sense self-sexualizing or self-objectifying. Their attention was at on their bodies and they just didn't have enough mental resources left to focus on their math problems. So this is, uh, and like I said, this a study has been repeated several times. Um, the original study with, was with U.S. white uh, college students, um, but it has been replicated with some uh, young women of other ethnicities as well. Uh, just very quickly, there might be physical health consequences of objectification. Also, um, teens sometimes report that they take up smoking in order to maintain a low body weight, to be thin like the models that they're trying to emulate. Smoking, of course, has a variety of negative consequences physically. Uh, plastic surgery among United States teens has been going up, and this is girls under the age of 18, so they're minors, which means that their parents must consent to these operations. Uh, so both invasive surgery, like uh, changing their nose, something like that where they have to be under anesthesia, has been increasing, but there's also been an increase in what's called minimally invasive treatments, like a chemical peel on the face. So that's uh, w with potential health consequences. Anytime you uh, go undergo surgery, there are, there are risks. Let me uh, move on now and talk a little bit about how the sexualization of women might be harmful to men and boys. Um, 
so some of the work that's been done, and, and there's less work on the impact on boys and men than there is on the impact on girls and women, but what has been done is interesting. When we expose uh, men or, uh, to images of women that are sexualized, that are objectifying, it causes them to rate real women as less attractive, and this includes their own romantic partner. So when men see these objectifying images, it actually uh, makes them feel less good about how their partner looks. Uh, and can lead to, and in one study at least has been shown to lead to, anxiety and hostility towards women and towards their partner. Um, men's objectifying belief about women and objectification of their romantic partners has also been shown in a couple of studies, including one that I conducted with some colleagues, uh, to correlate with less satisfaction in the relationship and less satisfaction with sexuality. So. Looking at these idealized women, these fantasy women, actually appears to cause men to feel less happy about their real lives and less satisfied with their real partners. So not, not a very good uh, outcome for them uh, as well. Some um, things that haven't really been studied yet but seem very plausible that um, might be harmful to men uh, one is that um, boys who learn to objectify women and girls may uh, have difficulty in forming a healthy and intimate adult relationships, may be, uh, impact, uh, be at risk for domestic violence. So we heard just a little bit earlier some uh, discussion about violence against women. Anytime that we objectify a person and we take away their human qualities and turn them into an object, it is a risk then that we would feel able to aggress against them. So again, this isn't something that's been looked at very closely yet, but it seems uh, like a risk that we should be mindful of. If men, if boys internalize this message of what women are and begin to value them only for their sexuality, then uh, they may be unable to relate to women in other ways as co-workers, as friends, uh, as competitors in the business world or else, elsewise, uh, will only think of them as sex objects uh, to, to their detriment and to the detriment of the women that uh, they interact with. And then finally, uh, even their ideas about themselves may be impacted negatively. So the, I mentioned that in the music videos, uh, men are portrayed, the singers are portrayed often as sexual players, that what one of the things they're very interested in is uh, having very many women and not in a, in a respectful kind of a way. Um, we may be teaching boys that this is what's most important for them. This is the identity that they should take on. This is who they should become, a sexual player probably not what we would most want our boys to aspire to. We'd like to um, have them maybe have better aspirations than that. Um, moving on now to some ideas about how the sexualization of girls might harm adult women. So adult women are definitely harmed by the sexualization of adult women in all the ways that we've talked about, risk for depression and uh, depressed mood, risk for eating disorders, uh, anxiety about the body, the same cognitive effects are uh, potentially there for adult women. But um, the, uh, and then the first bullet point talks a little bit about perceptions of others. So uh, really interesting study that asked people to rate uh, the same woman but dressed in a sexual way versus in a more professional way, rate her on her, um, her competence and her intelligence and the woman who is dressed sexy uh, was rated as less competent and less intelligent. So in the workplace, if women are perceived in a sexual way, it appears that uh, their coworkers and their superiors are likely to uh, not think as highly of their professional abilities. The, particularly the sexualization of girls may be harming adult women in that as we, if we, pull the standard of beauty younger and younger, so women are trying to meet a standard that increasingly is um, 
uh, you know, a, a teen, uh, what a, a 17 or 16 year old looks like, uh, one of the impacts of that is a potential increase in plastic surgery rates. And uh, um, plastic surgery for adult women in the US has also been going up, in particular Botox injections that get rid of, temporarily get rid of uh, wrinkles by paralyzing muscles in the face have been skyrocketing recently. Now, let me uh, move on a little bit to talk about an impact on broader society. And I, I think actually that this is one of the things about your cause association that's so exciting is that uh, it's thinking of this problem as a social problem, something that impacts all of us, that impacts our communities and looks at what, what those impacts are. And, and I think that's a very promising way to think about it. Uh, sexualization is very linked to sexism, uh, to discrimination against women, and uh, it, it has been shown to increase uh, sexist attitudes uh, and sexist beliefs. So when you see these objectifying images of women, uh, it, it tends to increase people's sexist thoughts. It may also impact girls' education aspirations and achievement. So some of the, the study I told you about the mental effects uh, if you are having difficulty concentrating in class because you're thinking about your appearance, <clears throat> that can potentially impact your academic achievement. Um, so let me go on to talk just a little bit more about both of these. Um, when we look at uh, the relationship between sexism and sexualization, here are some of the studies that have been done. When uh, people, men and women, view sexually objectifying media they are more accepting of rape myths, so myths about rape, such as that women really want it, or uh, myths that blame the victim in rape. They're more accepting of sexual harassment, and they're more accepting of interpersonal violence, especially violence against women. When we uh, expose people to uh, sexually objectifying media in the lab, uh, it leads to harsher judgments of real women in various ways. Uh, one of those I talked about earlier, that men judge their female partners more harshly when they, after they've been exposed to objectified images. Uh, it also causes more sexist behavior in the lab. So some experiments have been done that have used um, what we call unobtrusive measures. So there's some sort of uh, interaction that the participants in the study are doing and they're videotaped or watched uh, very closely by a, by a researcher. And uh, it, things like standing very close to the woman, asking sexist questions of her, those things go up. In an in a, um, interaction that's supposed to be non-sexual, they go up after uh, the men are exposed to objectifying pictures of women. And then a little bit more about the educational aspirations. So with a sweater swimsuit uh, study is relevant here. Other work has been done as well. So in one uh, set of studies, young women were exposed to either a, a sexy pretty ad, that's the, what the researchers called it, but we, it's a sexualized ad uh, in, term, in our terminology. So they, uh, one group of people looked at those, another group of people looked at gender neutral ads the young women who, who viewed the, uh, the sexy pretty ads uh, were less interested in math and science careers after looking at these ads, and they reported lower leadership aspirations. So they had uh, less of an idea that they could be leaders uh, going forward. Another study, and this is one that I just uh, conducted with a colleague, and it's not published yet, but it's under review. Also an experiment where we had young girls play with Barbie dolls, uh, one group and another group play with a non-sexualized doll, a Mrs. Potato Head doll. It's a doll shaped like a potato and uh, has little plastic ears and stuff that you can put in it. Um, and the girls who were playing with the Barbies, and then we asked the girls, uh, how, you know, could you do this career? Could you do, could do this career? We showed them pictures of different uh, settings and asked them if they could do the job of a doctor, a pilot, a <coughs> teacher, and so forth. And uh, <coughs> girls who played with the Barbies said they could do fewer careers than boys could do. 
both male stereotyped careers and, interestingly, female stereotyped careers. So playing with the Barbies seemed to suppress their career aspirations. Um, and uh, we, we didn't see uh, uh, children who played with the non-sexual toys having that, um, that decrement in the number of careers, or there's less of a difference between the careers they thought they could do and the careers they thought a boys could do. So um, very suggestive that even at a very young age, uh, playing with sexualized toys can have a negative impact. Uh, and just a bit more about education. Uh, the uh, problem of sexual harassment in schools is a very serious problem and deserves our attention. Can have uh, quite severe negative consequences for girls. In some cases, it really makes it virtually impossible for them to study and to pay attention to their, uh, to their studies. Uh, and we see that sexist and objectifying attitudes such as those that come from viewing sexualized media, those are linked to sexual harassment. So uh, we've seen that sexualization is very common, sexualization of women and girls, very common, very prevalent. Uh, it also has a host of negative consequences. Now we'd like to uh, think a bit about, is there anything we can do about this? And uh, I'll talk very briefly about uh, working through schools, working through the family, and working directly with girls, and then much more of the conference will be devoted to this issue of what can we do about this problem. Uh, so just starting some ideas, and these are in the task force report as well, a little bit of elaboration of them, some things that schools can do. One very promising technique is uh, to develop and implement media literacy programs. So uh, we want to give children some tools. Uh, we can't protect them from seeing all objectifying images, so we want to give them some tools that will help them to be able to interpret and critique these images instead of accepting them uncritically. So the goal is that the student, uh, the children will become, learn to become active in their viewing of media rather than passive. They can interpret it rather than just consume it. Um, athletics are a potential uh, avenue for girls that they can develop a resistance to sexualizing messages, and I'll come back to that in a minute and say a bit more. Um, it, it, athletics, uh, because of the, um, the focus on the body, that's not a sexualizing focus. It seems that that maybe has special promise but many other uh, activities as well can give girls opportunities to develop themselves in ways that aren't focused just on appearance, that show them that, uh, uh, that there's other things that we value about them. So participation in arts and music, other kinds of extracurricular uh, activities, and then education about objectification and sexualization. Uh, it, potentially the schools are an app appropriate uh, point to, um, to do that. Now, I uh, just want to talk really briefly about athletics again a, a little bit more. Um, female athletes in the media are more likely to be shown in sexualized than in performance images. And what do I mean by that? Let me show you. Here's a US downhill skier, Lindsey Vaughn, shown in a performance image. She is doing her sport and doing it quite well. Uh, in contrast, uh, this is an image of her and three of her teammates in a sexualized uh, portrayal. So she's the one on the far left, and she does have her skis with her, but she's not really using them. Uh, the folk, and she's not wearing ski, ski garb, she's wearing a swimsuit. Uh, so really the focus here is on what her body looks like and how sexy it is, not on what her body can do, not on her athletic achievement. Some really interesting research um, by uh, Beth Daniels has been uh, showing how important it is to have performance-based images of women rather than sexualized images of women athletes. Uh, in some of her studies, uh, she asked teen girls to look at performance-based versus sexualized images. And when girls saw the picture of the skier actually skiing, um, Uh, I lost my I lost my slides, but um, when she saw the picture of the girl actually skiing, 
she um, was able to, um, she, uh, girls were, um, uh, had better uh, ideas about women, uh, they were more, um, uh, they were more, um, uh, yeah, can you back up just a little? Yeah, that, well, yeah, right there, that's good. Um, so they thought uh, more about their physical abilities than how they look, just like the athlete was being portrayed in terms of how she, uh, could, what she could do rather than how she could look. Girls thought about themselves the same way too. They were more likely to say that she was a good role model when she was uh, shown skiing rather than shown in the bathing suit. And this was true, interestingly, whether or not the girls were athletes themselves. It didn't matter if they participated in sport or not. Uh, this was true for them. Uh, and teen boys also responded positively to the performance-based images. So they were more likely to talk about how competent the women athlete was rather than her looks. Again, giving them a broader perspective of women and what women can do. Um, some ideas uh, quickly for the uh, family uh, and what families can do. And again, we'll talk more about this. Um, one idea is that is very uh, effective is for parents when they uh, when their children consume media, watch with them, talk to them about uh, about what they're seeing, and this is a way to help them uh, <coughs> interpret it in a more critical way. Um, many families have a focus on religion or spirituality, and this can be a great counter to the sexualizing messages as well. So that we're not teaching girls that what's important is how they look, we're teaching them about something higher, something deeper. Uh, that's what's important to us. And uh, we can also help girls uh, to become activists. And uh, here's just a, a recent success story. This young 14-year-old girl who helped to launch a petition to get Seventeen magazine in the US to stop photoshopping its models. Uh, very exciting for her that she was able to do this and get Seventeen to respond. She was supported in this effort by an organization that was started by a colleague of mine who was also on the APA task force called SPARC, Sexualization Protest Research, uh, Action Research uh, and uh, Action Research and Knowledge. Um, so adults helping girls to learn how to become activists. Uh, we can also think uh, publicly, uh, public policy, what we can do. Some of these are things that I've talked about already regarding the schools. Um, so uh, media literacy programs could be developed by, uh, not just by individual schools, but available at a higher level. Um, and we know these have been effective in other domains, for example, in helping kids to resist messages about drugs and alcohol. And we think they can be effective in critiquing sexualization as well. Um, parents can encourage their kids to do sports, schools can provide it, but as a matter of public policy, we also can make sure that we uh, provide avenues for girls. In the U.S., there's something called Title IX that was enacted in the 70s and uh, was uh, provided, it really changed the landscape dramatically for girls uh, in sports and schools and has been very effective. Uh, and. Uh, having equality and opportunities between men and women. But not just athletics, but other kinds of extracurricular uh, opportunities like scouts and science camps and anything that gives girls the message that there's lots more to who they are and who they can be than simply um, how they look and how sexy they are. Uh, we can work with industry to try to eliminate uh, sexualized images. But moreover, I think it's really important to try to develop alternative images. So we might never be successful at totally eliminating these messages, but if we can, uh, instead of making them a, a flood, and the only thing that we see, let's see if we can flood the airwaves with alternative images of women that are more positive, alternative images of girls. We could do this uh, in terms of public policy by giving grants to artists who pro produce this type of material. Help girls to create their own videos and programming. Uh, and maybe provide awards for positive commercial programming or products. Uh, let's say thank you to the uh, marketers and the uh, entertainment professionals who provide positive images of girls and women. 
So in conclusion, um, it's so delightful to see so many people here concerned about this issue. And I know that all of us uh, want the best for our girls. Uh, we love our girls and we want them to have happy childhoods and we want them to grow up to become happy and confident and successful adults. And I believe that if we work together, um, as your cause association is doing, and as all of you, I hope, are, are doing as well, we can provide a better environment for our girls, one that's more supportive, one that's more healthy, and it will enable them to achieve the potential that they have. Um, I have great hopes for our girls. I think they can change the world, and it's our job to give them the environment that will help them to do that. Thank you so much.